She writes about black girls, about overweight black girls, about overweight black girls with alcoholic mothers who use tough love of poetry and books and brains to think themselves off the ugly streets. Welcome to Women in Theater. I'm Linda Weiner, theater critic and arts columnist of Newsday. And our guest today is actor, playwright, Dale Orlander Smith, whose recent play, Yellow Man, crawls inside the racism inside American racism. Hi. Hi, how are Hi. you? Hi. Okay, now you're going to want to argue with me about, uh, uh, <laughs> about all of that. But let's start with, I, I remember hearing you say, I don't do the pretty stuff. <laughs> no, I don't. I, you don't, do no, you? No, I yeah. don't. I don't. I'm interested in the darker side of human nature, where uh, we're forced, I guess, to look at ourselves and bring it to a light. I think that's beautiful. Uh, people like O'Neill who've done that, Sam Shepard that have done that, uh, August Wilson does that. Uh, you know, the, the French writers like Comte de Rimbaud. I'm interested in that, where we're, uh, you know, the, the, the stuff, the stuff that we don't want to look at, which is just as natural. We're not at home with the darker side of stuff, and I think we need to be. So that I, I like writing about that stuff. And yet your content, your context, is different from all of those white guys. What do you mean? Why can't, no, I mean, I think we're, 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 we're working from a shadow to get to a light. I, I don't think it's much different, really. I think we're on the same page. I'm a, I don't know whether I'm as good as those guys, but I, 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 I certainly i am trying to do what they do. All your work so far seems to me to be about about getting out. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Um, it's not so about much about finding a way to think your way off the block. Figuratively and literally, yeah. Um, that block could be in South Carolina. That block could be, you know, in Paris. Uh, yeah, where we're again, um, you know, the, the three fingers pointing back at you. Um, at what point? Do certain people come from a set, of, uh, a set of circumstances, and they're forced to look at themselves? So that's that's the stuff that does interest me. Yeah, that's that's what I'm trying to write about. How much of your work is autobiographical? A lot of people automatically assume it's autobiographical because a lot of the work has been one people shows. Yeah, up until Yellow Man. Up, up until, until Yellow this. Man, and you know, it's become a. I've stopped writing in that genre because it's become. It's really become um, indulgent. Uh, most people do have an interesting life. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a piece of theater. Even if it's not directly autobiographical, I've used certain things, and of course, when I've told people this, automatically they've 86 everything else that I've said, oh, she's saying that it is autobiographical. I've used a few things from my life, but even if it's not directly, it represents somehow what interests me yeah. and how the way, you know, uh, the, the, uh, how, how the kind of work that I'm interested in. I don't want to write any, again, like I'm saying, the one people stuff no more because of that. Uh -huh. you know? And I'm glad that other people are doing the one person plays, which is really great. What I tried to do was similar to like Bogosi and what Ruth Draper was doing. Uh -huh. a, you know, one person doing a, a story that has a beginning, a middle, and end. The story, the conflict, and the resolution. You just have one person doing it. Where you play many characters. Yes, exactly. But in these characters, these characters frequently would have a girl child mm -hmm. who had an alcoholic mother. Mm -hmm. You were a girl child with an alcoholic mother? Not necessarily. You weren't? I'm a girl child. Um, I was a girl child. You were a girl child. Mm -hmm. um, so the stories about your alcoholic mother are not true. It's not important. It's not it's important. It's too limiting now. You would like to get away from that. Uh, again, whether it's true or not true is not even the issue. Okay. Yeah, it's whether mm -hmm. it's true or not true. I mean, it's. You know, everybody, again, uh, people have this Eid fix about, you know, what's autobiographical and yeah. what's not. I'm interested in stories, and I'm interested in telling, hopefully, good, clear stories, succinct stories. And that's, that's, I think that's the thing that's most important, opposed to whether it's autobiographical or not. In Yellow Man right now, right. <coughs> excuse me, your first two-character play, right. which was a finalist for the Pulitzer in mm. 2001. 2002, actually. 2002, thank yeah. you. Yeah. They always do that the year after. It's yeah, confusing. No, it's very for me. strange. And and open the season at Manhattan Theater Club on the main stage. Right. Um. And has been produced at at least five regional theaters. Yes, I believe it's five at this point. Yes. <laughs> I believe it's yes. We went from the McCarter to the Wilma, 
ACT Seattle. So actually, it's it's more like three, isn't it? McCarter, Wilma, ACT Seattle. So three, three regional theaters. Not Lone Wolf. Oh gosh, and the Long Wharf, of course. Those guys are going to kill me. I'm and sorry, guys. And that, yeah, Long okay. Wharf, they the S4, <laughs> so it's four. Okay. I'm sorry, anyway, guys. Anyway, <laughs> that's all right. Whatever, whatever. Here, in this one, you were. It's it's no longer a New York setting. It's uh, South Carolina. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the play? I wanted to look at uh, a couple of things. I wanted to look at the the ramifications of race, both how it uh, affected black people. From, from, from certainly from white racism, but also how the way people take on the very bias that's been done onto them and they perpetuate it. I want to look at the sins of the father, the sins of the mother. I think every group of people do this. You know, often, you know, I was talking with one of the ladies back, uh, and she said that, you know, her husband didn't know that this happened among black people. Every group, the, the, the rift between, say, Eastern European Jews versus German Jews, the rift between blondes and brunettes has nothing to do with hair color. It has to do with racial purity. Oh, so, sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. So, my, my father's people were, Ju were um, Russian Jews, and my mother's people were Lithuanian Jews. I mean, go. even be, you know, and so she, they were Litvaks. Mm -hmm. and, and no one ever said Litvaks without saying, <laughs> Litvaks there you go. in my family, there you go. which is, you know, right. so, yes, of yes. course, they're within every, within, every ethnic group. Right, and, yeah. Yeah, and you know, and it's, you know, uh, again, I wanted to look at in terms of what that meant in terms of desirability, size, hue, uh, hair texture, all that stuff, what that stuff means. Um, and I, I, I touched on it, I think, in the play a little. Touched on it, uh, <laughs> she thinks, in the play a yeah, little bit. Yeah. There's two characters. You play Alma. Alma. And then you have a wonderful actor who plays the high yellow character. Yeah. The high yellow. Yeah. His, his name is? His name is Eugene. And, but yeah. his real name is Howard W. Overshone. He's wonderful a great actor. actor. Wonderful actor. And for people who don't know what yellow means, yes. yellow is a nasty term. High yellow is a nasty yeah. term used against lighter skinned blacks. And so both characters are basically in the in the the, um, the strict sociological term absorbing the prejudice of the dominant group mm -hmm. so that so that this big black girl mm -hmm. it, whose mother is big and black mm -hmm. is hated by her mother mm -hmm. I mean, that. again, this, this, this large-sized black woman who's been taught to, to hate herself because she's a large size. I never use the word overweight because I okay. said uh, overweight uh, over, over who's, what? Over who, okay. according to whose standards. Okay, I buy that. Um, you know, and also the, the, the perception of a darker-skinned, large-sized woman, you know, that, that whole... I, I wrote about it because the perception of dark-skinned, large women as being poor and... Uh, ignorant and uh, not looking at the self-hate that's underneath that the ramifications of what that meant so you know sociologically socioeconomically uh, the picture that's painted I wanted to look at that and you know to, to show this is what this is what the, this is what the end result of this is and how this has been passed on she's been taught to hate herself and try to pass this on yes, to her daughter the flip side of the action too is how the way a lighter skinned black man uh, internally has been made to suffer as well you know um, and he has a darker skinned and father. Has, and he has a darker skin who's father who's jealous also, of him. Who's jealous of him. You know, uh, we've, we've never seen, as far as I've known, again, we, the, 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 the dynamic between uh, lighter skin and darker skin within the play. We've not seen how the way darker skinned people have been made to hate themselves. Lighter skinned people have been made to hate themselves. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, there's uh, angst, pain on both ends of the spectrum. Is this play as popular? within the black community as it is in the white community? I was a little worried. I still was going to do it anyway, but um, black people have been very supportive of this. I've had a few people, you know, there have been a few talkbacks at Manhattan Theater Club where some people felt that I was quote unquote airing dirty laundry, yeah. but they said, you know, and it was, and again, it was brought to uh, the attend to their attention, saying that every group of people do this. It's also generational. I find the young, like younger people, are glad that it's out there. You know, older people are kind of going, you know, and especially the, the majority of the audience is white. So sometimes there is laughter, and um, you know, I discard that laughter because that's ignorant. And you know, I, I actually yesterday I was watching a woman look around, you know, because she was she was sitting with I assume to be her son. 
and they were mostly white people around and she was going like this and you know and then later on we spoke a little bit and I said did you feel exposed so she says kind of and I said I understand why you would I said but you also realize that white people do this and me writing this do I'm not this, do this meaning what uh, internal racism internal bias Oh, that they have their own. Yeah, there, yes. there is. And I said, uh, if they laugh, I said, it, it just goes to show that they're ignorance. And I said, again, um, by my writing this, I'm not letting white people or black people off the hook. I think you said once that you're not going to get any NWACP awards. You know, I, well, they've that... been really nice, too. The Jersey <laughs> contingent, I'm, yeah, they were really nice. But I, I write, I, I am, I can't write for an entire race or an entire sex. This is a story, not the story. One woman did in Philadelphia send an email to the Wilma saying that it, you know, she's a dark-skinned woman who never, I don't want to give too much away, but never like abused her kid. And, and I said, you know, people often, when you, especially when you write about stuff like this, they're looking for justice, you know, um, and looking for validation. And I, I can't do that. That's not what I do. I write about things that interest me. You know, in terms of positive role models, people have their parents for that. That's not what I do. Did you have your parents? Hmm? Did you have your parents for positive role model? She is so determined to ask me whether this stuff is autobiographical. You are so slick. Well, it's just a little who are you. Uh -huh, just yeah. a little who are you question. I get around. Okay. <laughs> I got around. Okay. okay. Uh, <clears throat> born in, in, uh, in Spanish Harlem. Yeah. Live okay. in the South Bronx. Yeah, I was raised between East Harlem and South Bronx, primarily in East Harlem. Right. And how did you get so turned on to poetry? Um, my mom would read Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and I always read voraciously, so that was, that was, that was there to a certain degree, and I, I would read the Bobsy Twins as a kid, and then later on I, uh, I read this book, The Mutant King, a guy named David Dalton wrote that, it was a biography on, uh, James Dean, and in that there was, like, quotes from Booth Tarkington, and, uh, from, um, He's, he creates fiction which generates life. That's uh, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I began to read, I, I was, and I said, oh wow, this is pretty cool. And then that's when I began to read. That book was instrumental in terms of me reading other people. Public school? I went to Catholic school. I'm a recovering Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Catholic school. And then after that I went to uh, public high school. Right, and then I did a few years in college and I dropped out. I had the sense to drop out. And you wrote poetry before you wrote plays. Yes, I did. I was, um, as a kid, I was in the New Yorican Poets Cafe. This is when Miguel Pinheiro obviously was alive. Uh, this is right after Short Eyes. And what he did was try to form a group called the Little Family, primarily for Latin kids and black kids. And, uh, you know, to show that everybody has a culture, that culture is not simply WASP-oriented, WASP-male-oriented. And that, you know, that was, a, it, it planted a seed, but that was a bust because, quite frankly, you know, when you're dealing with a junkie, which is what he was, you know. And then after that, I, I studied at, at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, the Saturday program. And then in college, I took uh, theater and film, and then I went to HB Studio, then very briefly in the actor's studio, and then a few private teachers after that. So I've... So you, want, you wanted to be a, a performer first. I was, I was an actor, yeah. I mean, I was doing plays on the Lower East Side when I was 16 years old. I read somewhere that you got tired of auditioning for, as, for welfare mother roles. Yeah, because when I, by the time I, you know, reached my 20s, you know, um, or and it, particularly like in the late 70s and the 80s, they were, they were, and it's still kind of prevalent. Um, there were a lot of musicals then. It's like bubbling brown sugar, and they were bringing all this stuff back. So I don't sing. I don't do that. And uh, you automatically, get, you know, Baptist musicals. And like I said, I was raised Catholic. I don't know anything about that. And uh, or what would happen, particularly that I'd, I'd get offered roles as a prostitute or as a welfare mother. And because I'm a large sized woman, automatically I'd either become desexed you know, by uh, playing, you know, you go girl, this kind of stuff, which is still pretty prevalent now. So I said, I'm going to start writing my own work because I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to, you know, gain 50 pounds, lose 50 pounds, get my jaw broken or reset. I'm not going to do any of that Frankensteinian stuff. I know some of the actors who are working, you know, on UPN, they're doing stuff, you know, those, 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 sh that, those shows. And uh, I can't do them. That, I know the other, you know, the alternative for the, some of them is to, like, be unemployed. I know some of them are absolutely miserable. But I would rather just do what I'm doing. 
And that's why you started writing your own work? Yeah, I mean, I've always wanted to write, too. Yeah. You know, because I, I would write it back then. I, you know, like if when I was doing the, the, the theater down on Lower East Side, somebody would say, okay, so-and-so didn't show up. Can you do something real quick? And I'd go, okay, and I would just make it up off the top of my head, and I would just do it. Uh-huh. Right. And the first time you actually got a play produced? Your own? This was in 92, 93. Is that Liar Liar? Yeah, Manhattan Class Company. Mm -hmm. with those guys, yeah. And then after that, it went to Beauty's, this other play, Beauty's Daughter, which was at the American Place Theater. And then um, Monster and The Gimmick, which was at New York Theater Workshop. They're great. Peter Askin, he directed early uh, Le Guzamo stuff. Yes. Played a major role in it. He's great. And then The Gimmick was with this guy, um, Chris Coleman, who's phenomenal. And then now Blanca Ziska, who's with Bl Yellow Man. Blanca Z Ziska is your, your director of Yellow Man, yeah. who is the, the artistic director at the Wilma Theater right. in Philadelphia. And she's going to direct a new piece, too. Uh, the new piece. First of all, she's a, a Czechoslovakian mm -hmm. immigrant. Mm -hmm. Right. What a peculiar collaboration. How did this happen? Um, what, initially, Marion McClinton, who directs the August Wilson sure. stuff, was supposed to direct this. And uh, he was working on King Headley. So you got a choice between me and you got August Wilson. Where are you going to go? And, uh, and he had a relationship with August. And uh, he ended up directing this. And someone said, well, can you, Blanca Ziska would be great. And I'd forgotten that I met Blanca because I was doing some theater in uh, Philadelphia at this place called The Painted Bride. And she came up to me. She goes, I would like for you to work in my theater. And then we, you know, we got reacquainted. She goes, remember when I came up to you a few years ago? And I went, oh, yeah, right. And she directed this piece called Portia Coffin, a nice, terrific playwright from Dublin named Marina Carr. And, you know, we sat down, we collaborated, because I've been working on Yellow Man. We've been working on it together for three years. And so the stuff that she's done with this, as well as a woman named Janice Perrin, who's the dramaturg at the McCarter, is great. I mean, I couldn't have done this piece without them, because I'm a very indulgent writer, you know. And they knew how to nick, nick and nip and tuck and form. What is this Irish connection? You just said something about Ireland. What I've, is this Irish connection? Years ago, I used to date an Irish guy. And uh, prior to that, prior to my dating him, I was always, I mean, one person I love, one of my favorite playwrights, and one of my favorite plays is Long Day's Journey Into Night. Um, now, when you ask me about autobiographical An stuff, another, you are... Another one of those, those <laughs> bright, those yeah, bright right. happy plays. Well, yes. see, it's funny. I mean, growing up in, you know, again, in, in, in El Barrio and, and in uh, the South Bronx, I saw a lot of drugs and a lot of alcoholism. And I remember reading this play when I was about 13 or 14 going, here's a turn-of-the-century Irish-American family and who's dealing with a mother who's a drug addict and these sons that are that are leaning toward, well, one who's a hardcore alcoholic, right? And this applies to the way, to the, a lot of the people that I know yeah. here in Harlem and the South Bronx. And the language of, of O'Neill's work. And so I was into that then, you know, the Celtic, and I began to read, um, after that I began to read Beckett after reading him. Mm -hmm. So then I would, you know, I hang around East Village and stuff, and I met this guy, and we were hanging out a little bit. And then he brought me to Dublin. I went to Dublin in 90, 94. I was on tour with the poets. You must have been very exotic there. Yeah, <laughs> I was, I was kind of like, you know, <laughs> look at your woman there with her hair dyed and all that. Right? And then just hearing... Well, they must have loved you. It was interesting. Right. But also hearing the stories, you know, hearing like, you know, pub life, you're hearing the stories. And I'm also of Caribbean descent. So, you know, there's a link between the Caribbean and between Ireland. Um, and the accent, again, when, when the Irish were brought over as indentured servants and stuff. So the, the, the Caribbean accent, in fact, is African and Celt. Mm -hmm. So just reading and that, so this, then that brings me to the new piece. Where, and I've also spent a lot of time in the United Kingdom. So I wanted to write about, I'm writing this, this piece that's similar to Yellow Man, uh, where you have two characters playing uh, other characters as well, these two brothers who are from the east end of London. And they're of a mixed marriage, Irish Protestant marriage. And the father was a failed singer. He wanted to be a singer like Van Morrison, better than Van Morrison. You know, the whole ideal of the 60s and how it collapsed for a lot of people. And here are these two kids, and one aspires to be a writer, the other one w watches a lot of 
American movies. And they come to, they both come to New York, and one of them falls in love with a Latina girl whose father is a failed poet who drives a cab. And she, you know, so it's, I'm writing it. So this it's, like, it's going to be a four-character piece. This is very different, right? I mean, this is a, a real next I'm step not in for this. you. Yeah, I'm not in this. I, I, I need some time just to write now. So for I want to do I want to write plays for other people. I'm also working on a novel, so yeah. Movies? You were in a Hal Hartley movie. That was years ago. Yeah, amateur. With Isabelle Hubert, who did a great film recently. Did you see that? The Piano Teacher. Ah, uh, no, I didn't. Brilliant. Now, I would love to do film, but I don't think I'm America's eye candy, and I don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be. I don't want I me mean, a lot. We've, America's got some great actors, but a film like Central Station won't get made here. A film like The Piano Teacher won't get made here. Mm. You know, but yeah, we've got some fabulous actors in this. Of course we do, you know. A lot of things I see I simply don't want to do. Nor would I be up for. Do you find that that the um, that black theater in a way in America has sort of gotten ghettoized again and and the um, and the, the black actors who are making it in movies are very European looking, is it? Well, it's interesting. Um, in reference, say, to Yellow Man, what we're talking about, it's not lost on me that, say, a Halle Berry or a Tandy Newton, uh, Vanessa Williams, they're working. You know, someone like CCH Pounder or, a, you know, Whoopi Goldberg, uh, people like that, darker skin actresses, you know, Alfie Woodard are not working as much. I mean, there's, I hate to use this word, exotic. And they deserve to work. Those women, you know, Dandy Newton and, and Jada Pinkett and Vanessa Williams deserve to work. But I'm aware of, you know, what's considered, quote, unquote, sexy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they fill a quota. You know, they're light, they're small bone, they're uh, keen featured, so it's enough to fill, you know, the, the Euro standards of beauty or what have you. The flip side of the action is darker skin actors work. There's never been within the history of film a light skin leading man. I mean, now that's beginning to change a little bit, say, with uh, Brian Stokes Mitchell, you know, but, you know, and they've been like, in terms of like, say, like strictly black films, there, there was a, a, an actor that someone mentioned to me, but in terms of mainstream actors, there's not, there's not been any. There's not been any. What an interesting double standard. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's very, you know, so in terms of me as an actor, uh, there is no, I'm, at, at this point, there's no room for me, and it's like the stuff that I'm asked to do, a lot of it I'm not going to do. I mean, people don't use the word mammy anymore. Like I was, someone had mentioned to me about possibly, there's a script that's about Lucille Ball, and they said, w are you willing to play her companion? And I knew exactly what that meant. Or not, not to read for it, you know. And I know what that means. I said, so what is, I, is her maid? Is what? And they, well, and they said, yes, yeah. no, I don't want to, I don't know, I'm not playing anybody's maid. So it hasn't changed. But if I looked like a Vanessa Williams or a Jada Pinkett or what have you, no one would approach me with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only person I can think who's a big girl who, you know, is like Queen Latifah. But see, also, again, if you're in music, that's a whole different thing, too. I'm just, strictly as an actor, you know, you don't really find that. So you have to do your own. I have to do my own. I'd love to do other stuff. I mean, I'd love to act in somebody else's work, you know. I, you said earlier that you had not seen the Deaf Poetry Jam that's on Broadway. No, I know. We're working at the same time. But you know that it has, it, it has grown out of... A lot of the same people came out of the new Eurekan Poet Cafe, mm -hmm. which is a, where you also worked at mm -hmm. some time. Mm -hmm. And Russell Simmons said that when you, a, when you go to high schools now and ask how many people write poetry, 80% of the kids raise their hands. Right. That shocked me. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody would have raised their hand when I was growing up, or if right. they did, they'd be embarrassed to raise right. their hand. Mm -hmm. Does that surprise you? Uh, no, it doesn't, because I mean, there's also different kinds of poetry. I mean, you know, the oral tradition you know, which gave birth, you know, to hip-hop. You've got, you've got hip-hop poetry, then you've got, narr I'm more of a narrative yeah. poet. So there's different kinds of poetry. And the poetry that they're talking about, which is very valid and, you know, I guess very necessary, not I guess, it is very necessary, is more music-oriented. Versing, say, like a, a County Cullen or a Claude McKay or a Sonia Sanchez or, uh, 
you know, uh, Sandra Maria Esteves, you know, who's also of uh, New Yorican. You know, so it's different. So it's different. So, yeah. It, um, I mean, the kind of poetry that I'm doing, say, would not be on Broadway because it's not music-oriented. But yet it's, but, I mean, both of them are very valid. Right. It wouldn't be in that. But then, but because it's narrative, it, you make it into plays. Yeah, I put it into plays. But, like, my stuff can't be, nor, nor should it be. It doesn't have to be set to music. You, with music, you can get away with so many things. You know, when something is music, I mean, it's like, I was telling a friend of mine about it. I said, you know, because she, she said she loves Gigi. I said, you know what Gigi is about, don't you? And she goes, what do you mean? I said, well, it's pretty much, I said, if you want to get technical, it's about pedophilia. And, but, you know, if you set it to music, you know, the best little whorehouse in Texas, you, if you can put anything that's connected with music, you can get away with it. You know? So music takes on a whole different thing when something, you know, yeah. I have to say, in, in Yellow Man, which I really, really enjoyed, Thank the, you. there are moments I was thinking back at the way that you would say a word that changed the use of the word, the, the meaning of the word, when Alma was going on to the train to go to New York, and she said she was going to the cocktail car, mm -hmm. and she'd say, cocktail. Yeah. <laughs> right. And cocktail just sounded different. And then she was going to get fall clothes. Yeah, and this is something clothes for the fall. Yeah. And um and it just and then she had sex finally with Eugene. Right. And the idea is that what was going through her mind, which I think all women have about, you know, body what image. what her body what she thought her body was looking right. like on the sheets. Mm -hmm. When he was just thinking about what a wonderful experience this was and how yeah. much he loved her warmth. Mm -hmm. And she was really thinking about about her, you know, her body. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I just, uh, I just found that really very touching. Mm -hmm. One quick last question. Oh. If, as a woman, you could change anything right now in the theater, snap your fingers, what would you change? That there shouldn't be women writers, we're just writers. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dale Orlandersmith. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. On behalf of League of Professional Theater Women, I'm Linda Weiner, and this has been Women in Theater.